Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, uh, let's learn, shall we? The biggest non-nuclear bomb in World War II. There was this... It was... World War One. I, I watched a... I, I watched a... There was a World War One bomb where the... Voice crack. Jesus Christ. Where they went, like, dug tunnels under no man's land to reach the other other side, the German position, and planted a bunch of bombs under it so they would retreat and then blow the thing up. Freaking enormous. Did I see a video of it, or just was I told the scale? I don't know. Let's learn. The biggest non-nuclear bomb in World War II. I'm repeating myself. In March of 1945, 15 specially modified Avro Lancaster bombers of 617 Squadron were on their way to a strategic target in western Germany. Aqueduct? The Allies have been attempting to demolish the Bielefeld viaduct using thousands of bombs since the beginning of the war, but with no success. This time, however, the 15 Lancasters were carrying just a single bomb each. Each one capable of destroying the very foundations of the target, one of which was a bomb that the world had never seen used before. The Grand Slam. During Earthquake World War II, bomb. the main weapon used by RAF Bomber Command was the General Purpose Bomb. Now, as the name suggests, this weapon attempted to satisfy a range of requirements and came in a variety of weights and explosive yields. But it did have significant limitations. The general so just before we hear the real reason so what are the what are you going to want so you're going to want a bomb that is the is large enough to cause a big boom but small enough that you can pack many bombs in a single plane to have more likely to be able to like cause destruction in in a larger area so I'm assuming finding that perfect ratio is is what went into to this. Of yields, but it did have significant limitations. The general purpose bomb used a thick walled metal casing with an explosive filler, and the earlier British versions had a charge to weight ratio of around 27%. That is to say, only 27% of the whole weight of the bomb is actually explosive. Now, as a comparison, the Germans were using general purpose bombs that had a charge to weight ratio of around 50%. The British response to this was to upgrade their bombs to medium capacity bombs. This improved the charge to weight ratio up to at least 40%. And coupled with a new filler with more explosive power, it was a marked improvement. Another limitation, and perhaps more significant. Wait, wait, what, 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 why was. I can't talk right now. What w what was going on in the other whatever percent of the bomb that wasn't um for you know creating the the you know for containing the explosives for aerodynamics purposes w what else was needed? Was that general improvement? Another limitation, and perhaps more significant, was that general purpose bombs are designed to explode either at or near the surface and destroy their target directly by explosive force. The most assured way to achieve destruction of the target is a direct hit. Unfortunately, bomb aiming technology at the time was poor, and therefore, so was accuracy. And so to improve a bombing raid's chance of success, Bomber Command used area bombardment, dropping large numbers of bombs over a wide area in the hope that the target would be hit. This obviously had the disadvantage of requiring large numbers of aircraft carrying large numbers of ordnance, and the inevitable collateral damage, including terrible civilian death numbers. It was also a limitation that due to the shortcomings of the general purpose bomb, it was quite easy to fortify critical installations using thick concrete walls. A possible solution to this problem had been undergoing investigation since the start of the war by the English engineer and inventor, Barnes Wallace. He had a theory that an exceptionally large, very heavy bomb, highly aerodynamic to achieve high speed, and with delayed detonation, would be able to cause the destruction of a target through shockwaves being transmitted through the ground. 
this theoretical bomb gained the nickname the Earthquake Bomb. His idea was to build a bomb 10 tons in weight with a hard armoured tip and to drop it from a height of 40,000 feet. The speed it would achieve in freefall he hoped would be almost supersonic and would have the effect of a 10 ton artillery shell being fired straight down into the ground. A delayed action fuse would allow sufficient time for the bomb to penetrate deep underground and the explosion would cause a shockwave equivalent to that of a 3.6 magnitude earthquake. The explosion would not need to breach the surface as the shockwaves would create a cavern underground which would then collapse, removing the foundations of structures or buildings on the surface. The need for a direct hit on a target is therefore no longer required, as just being close by to targets such as dams, railways, viaducts and even reinforced buildings would cause considerable damage or even complete destruction. As there was no aircraft available to carry such a bomb to such a height, Wallace even designed a heavy lift high altitude bomber specifically for the job, the six engined Victory Bomber. Sadly for Wallace, these ideas didn't gain a lot of traction from the military decision makers at the time, and so Wallace switched his attention to another radical concept, the bouncing bomb. The success of Operation Chastise on the 16th and 17th of May 1943 had shown that not only had Wallace been successful with his innovative designs, but also that the RAF now had a very capable heavy bomber in the Avro Lancaster. They now actively encouraged Wallace to revisit his earthquake bomb, although no contracts were signed until they had been proven to work. 449. Um, I'm surprised that there's such, you know, flat edges. I, I would have thought that you'd want to kind of make the edges more of a, like a gradual cone on either side. Because I, I just intuitively, and clearly I'm wrong, that it works. I would think that an edge might catch the water in a weird way and then just force it to not keep skipping, but clearly it works. Bouncing bomb for Lancaster. They now actively encourage Wallace to revisit his earthquake bomb, although no contracts were signed until they had been proven to work. The first design for his earthquake bombs was called Tallboy. It had a mass of approximately 12,000 pounds, a length of 21 feet, and a diameter of 38 inches. To prevent the bomb breaking apart on impact, it was cast in one piece of high tensile steel, and it was shaped to be as aerodynamically clean as possible to allow it to reach a much higher terminal velocity than that of traditional bombs. The fins attached to the case enabled it to spin as it fell, giving it much greater stability and prevent tumbling and therefore enhance its accuracy. It was designed to be released from 18,000 feet and a forward speed of 170 miles per hour. These release figures would mean it would impact the ground at 750 miles per hour, with enough energy to make a crater 80 foot deep and 100 feet across, and also penetrate concrete up to 16 feet thick. The bomb was packed with an explosive called Torpex that was 50% more powerful than TNT by mass and had only been in use since 1942. It had to be melted and then poured by hand into the bomb casing, and after filling, a one inch layer of pure TNT was poured over the top of the Torpex before sealing with a composite wax. You can melt the explosive? That, what? By mass, with an explosive only been in use since 1942. It had to be melted and then poured by hand into the bomb casing, and after filling, a one inch layer of pure TNT was poured over the top of the top. Uh, if melting the explosive doesn't make it to explode, but the TNT explosion will, I, I, I am very curious as to how this stuff works. Opex before sealing with a composite wax. The precision manufacturing process meant that these bombs were incredibly expensive and so were only to be used against high value targets where no other option was viable. And air crews were also instructed that all unused bombs be returned to base rather than jettisoned at sea. Due to the heavy weight of the tall boy as well as the high release altitude, the Avro Lancasters needed alterations. To save weight, they had armor plating removed, as well as some defensive armaments. The Bombay doors also had to be modified to accommodate such an enormous payload. The first use of the Tallboy took place on the night of the 8th of June, 1944.
was the little boy that uh, was dropped with the first atomic bomb, or I guess the second atomic bomb after the one they tested, um, was it named after this, or was boy just a, a common word to name these giant bombs? Or, you know. Two days earlier, Allied forces had stormed the beaches of Normandy as part of the D-Day landings. Intelligence revealed that a German Panzer division was heading west to engage the Allied invaders. They were traveling by rail and were expected to use a railway crossing over the Loire River, as well as a railway tunnel. Shortly before 11 p.m. on the 8th of June 1944, 25 Lancasters of 617 Squadron successfully got airborne from RAF Woodhall Spa and headed for Saumur, Western France. Such was the hasty nature of this raid, three Lancasters could not get loaded in time and so didn't take part. Of the 25 Lancasters, six were carrying eight 1,000 pound general purpose bombs and 19 were carrying tall boys. To help with accuracy, three de Havilland Mosquito aircraft of 83 Squadron Pathfinder Force were at the head of the flight. At approximately 2 a.m., they were over the target and launched flares to assist the arriving Lancaster bomb aimers. And all the bombers released their tall boys successfully. Several direct hits were reported, causing the railway line and the bridge to be destroyed. One tall boy actually bored his way through the hillside and exploded in the railway tunnel, which was 60 feet below the surface, causing a complete blockage. Wow. All of the aircraft returned safely to base. The tall boy was a complete success and would continue to be used for the remainder of the war against notable targets such as V-2 rocket assembly bunkers and the Bismarck-class battleship Turpids. Now, whilst all of this was a vindication of Wallace's designs, he was still thinking of his original concept of a 10-ton Earth... Sorry. This giant bomb was used to sink a, a battleship? Battleship Turpids. Now, whilst all of this was a vindication of Wallace's designs, he was still thinking of his original concept of a 10-ton earthquake bomb, and work was well underway to build this larger version of the Tall Boy. It was essentially identical to the Tall Boy, just on a bigger scale, and called Grand Slam. It had a mass of 22,000 pounds, a length of 26 feet 6 inches, and with an added tail length of 13 feet 6 inches, and a diameter of 3 foot 10 inches. With a charge to weight ratio of 50%, it had a blast yield equivalent to 6.5 tonnes of TNT, making it by far the most powerful non-nuclear weapon used in World War II. Okay, so... The charge to weight ratio is 50%. So, what else is needed for the other? What what compromises comprises? Sorry, compri not compromise comprises the other fifty percent of weight. Just aerodynamics and stability things that you have to do. I okay. Um. And just like its smaller sibling, it was filled with molten torpex. And such was the quantity required, it would take a whole month before it was set. The long, complex manufacturing process, as well as its cost, meant that, just like the tall boy, an undelivered bomb would have to be returned to base, rather than jettisoned at sea. As a result, crews were instructed to divert to RAF Carnaby in East Yorkshire to make use of the longer runway. It was still intended to be dropped from 40,000 feet, but mighty as the Avro Lancaster was proving itself to be, this was still unachievable and would have to be dropped from altitudes typically around 15,000 feet. And even then, the Lancaster would have to be modified substantially. 32 Lancaster B-1 Specials were built and supplied to 617 Squadron. They were fitted with upgraded Merlin 24 engines with paddle bladed propellers, which gave more power. The removal of the front and mid upper gun turrets removed weight and also improved the aerodynamics. And whereas for the tall boy, the Bombay doors were adapted, for Grand Slam, they were removed completely. Also, the undercarriage had to be strengthened to allow for the added weight, should the bomber have to land with an undelivered weapon. The first B-1 Special Aircraft arrived on the 5th of March, and 617 Squadron's Canadian Commander, Group Captain Johnny Fauquier, had a Grand Slam loaded on board, and he took it for a test flight to check the Lancaster's handling. He recalled that he was becoming concerned during the takeoff roll, as he would normally be airborne at 110 miles per hour. 
but he was still stuck to the ground at 145 miles per hour. Finally though, and with the wings bending up at a startling angle, the aircraft left the ground. And following a 20 minute flight, he landed safely and declared the Lancaster safe to carry the Grand Slam. On the morning of the 13th... I wonder how much runway you need to where it's like the, the point of no return. It's like you have to stop now in order to not end up rolling off the runway and crashing. And I'm sure it's different depending on the weight of the, of the aircraft. But that's got to be very tense, just knowing when to quit. ...of March to carry the Grand Slam. On the morning of the 13th of March, the Grand Slam was dropped for the first time over the RAF bombing range at Ashley Walk in Hampshire. It left a crater 30 feet deep with a diameter of 124 feet. The test drop was a success. Later that same day, two Grand Jesus. Slams were prepared with 11 second fuses. One was loaded onto Group Captain Falkier's aircraft and the other to that of Squadron Leader Charles Calder. The RAF had a target in mind. Since the beginning of the war, the Bielefeld Viaduct in Western Germany, which carried the strategically important Ham-Minden railway line, had been subjected to several attacks and over 3,500 tons of bombs had been dropped. Although regularly being damaged, it had stubbornly refused to fall. Now, two Grand Slams were on the way, along with 18 other Lancasters carrying tall boys. However, frustratingly, the raid had to be aborted due to cloud obscuring the target. So the next day, the 14th of March 1945, 16 Lancasters would try again. Two Lancasters of Group Captain Fauquier and Squadron Leader Calder were armed with Grand Slams, and the remaining 14 with Tall Boys. During startup, Fauquier's Lancaster developed an engine fault and had to be withdrawn, leaving Squadron Leader Calder to deliver the single Grand Slam. Like previous Tall Boy missions, the target was to be marked by four de Havilland mosquitoes of the Pathfinder Force and there was also a Mosquito of 627 Squadron to film the attack. Shortly after 1.30pm, 15 Lancasters roared into the sky from RAF Woodhall Spa in Lincolnshire and headed east, accompanied by an escort of P-51 Mustangs. And by 4.30pm, the squadron was over the target. Squadron leader Calder's aircraft came in from the south and released the Grand Slam from a height of 12,000 feet. As the bomb departed the bomb bay, the Lancaster lurched upwards when free of the enormous weight. The Grand Slam, now accelerating towards its terminal velocity, was right on target for the viaduct. Spotters and other aircraft and the filming Mosquito reported that the Grand Slam impacted the ground approximately 100 feet to the side of the viaduct. 11 seconds later, with tall boys detonating all around it, the Grand Slam exploded. It's it hard to distinguish which damage was called by Tall Boys and which by the Grand Slam. Real, real footage. It, it doesn't say like um. Uh, so, th this is the actual moment. Uh, With Tall Boys detonating all around it, the Grand Slam exploded. It was hard to distinguish which damage was called by Tall Boys and which by the Grand Slam. But it is true to say that alongside where the Grand Slam hit, a 260 feet span of the viaduct was demolished. Later reconnaissance photos also showed that at the north end of the viaduct, another 200 foot span was destroyed. The mission was a complete success and all aircraft returned to base safely. During the remainder of March 1945, a further 156 day sorties were flown comprising of 40 tall boys and 31 Grand Slams. By the end of the war, 41 Grand Slam bombs had been dropped. Bomber Command Chief Arthur Harris was suitably impressed by Barnes Wallace's invention, and he had been drawn up several plans to use it to attack heavily fortified targets before victory in Europe was declared on Tuesday, the 8th of May, 1945. Thanks for watching. Please help to grow this channel by hitting the like button and consider subscribing for more content. That was great. Really interesting. The Northern Historian really shows you how big of a, not that anyone needs to be told, that how big of a game changer an atomic weapon was after hearing of all of the, you know, inaccuracy and, well, if you get a big enough explosion, accuracy doesn't matter as much. Really interesting. Love you all. Hope you guys are all doing well. Would appreciate any comments down below, any answers to any questions I had. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll see you guys next time. Bye.